Hi, I'm Simon Bridges, CEO of the Auckland Business Chamber, and welcome to another Business Insights webinar as part of our series. Today, I'm really delighted to have Tara Lorigan with us. Uh, she's a friend of mine and a very inspiring person who's got a very helpful way of thinking about things. Um, she's a, biz a visionary leader, a disruptor, and passionate high-performance proponent. Uh, she's the founder of Company of Us, a high-performance consultancy dedicated to human buoyancy as the source of organisational resilience, flourishing, and sustainability. The Company of Us engages with executive-level leaders and their teams to embed the high-performance practices that underpin this. In 2012, uh, she founded Co. Uh, dot of Woman, a globally unparalleled model and world-class development organisation dedicated to championing practical how-to of success. Its comprehensive ecosystem offering is built on the unique three-pillar platform, which combines deep practical knowledge with extensive research on gender, how women excel, performance, the science of optimal performance, and thirdly, domain acumen entrepreneurial and leadership capacities. The membership features thousands of women at every stage of success. Tara founded the New Zealand Hall of Fame for Women Entrepreneurs. The purpose of the Hall of Fame is to recognize the significant impact of women. To date, 37 of the country's most successful entrepreneurs have been inducted. Tara has been honored as a member of the New Zealand Order of Merit for her contributions to business and women. A gifted communicator. She is a sought after speaker and coach. Well, Tara, welcome. Thank you very much. It's really great to be here, Simon. Thank you for the invitation. Fantastic. Well, look, um, there's so much we could talk about, but I know uh, that today, you know, there's a, a relatively uh, specific uh, topic you're going to be talking to us about around high performance. So, yeah, yeah. take it away. We'd love to hear it. I'll, I'll um, I'll try not to interrupt too much, but if I feel like I've got something really salient, I will, and um, yeah, we'll have a bit of a chat at the end for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Jump in um, at any time, Simon. Um, it would be great to have your curiosity on this. So I want to talk about the high about high performance today, and um, I'm going to sort of call it the high performance leader. Most of the folks that are listening to this will be um, in the business community. And really, I guess one of my passions is that those of us who would maybe have the tag leader, um, that we are really uh, buoyant in that role and able to sustain ourselves. Uh, and that will mean, of course, that we are great leaders of teams that can flourish and organizations that can sustain themselves. And the reality that in the sort of modern era that we're living in, when we're really, really brought into what I call the cult of busy, there are actually very few exemplaries of high performance leadership that I could point to. Uh, that's not uh, in any way a criticism. It's understandable that these things take time to uh, find out about. And so in part, that's why I'm hoping to give you a mini masterclass in the next um uh, while to give you a bit of a leg up on this journey for yourself. So what do I mean when I'm talking about high performance? It's a state and this phrase of energized tranquility is borrowed from somebody else, but it's a really powerful phrase. So it's a state of energized tranquility brought about by intentional habitual practices, starting with energy. So it's not rocket science. This is something that can be available to anyone. I'm going to talk you through some of, of, of those practices in a moment. But the outcome or, or really the value proposition is that you will have this state of energized tranquility. So it's, it's an all all on and deeply grounded as your kind of MO. So more importantly, um, the real driver here for me is that is that we get to live our lives on our terms and have the energy to do it so that our world or the things that we're dedicating ourselves to are not the reason for us expiring. Um, and so I'm hoping that this is something that uh, you can see is, is really worth some time. So what are the outcomes? Um, well, there are things that will be consistently different as a result of building practices and habits for yourself. The number one is most definitely energy. 
the energy to dedicate ourselves to our priorities, whatever those priorities are, not just time for work and then pour yourself in the door to your family at the end of the day, getting the dregs of us. Um, no, energized from the beginning to that lovely wind down period. We'll talk about it in a little bit at the end of the day so you can refuel again. Productivity. Um, having consistent levels of productivity to be distinguished very clearly from just working our buns off or working more or longer hours. Actually, when we are in that state of energized tranquility, we don't need to work as long and we can be more productive. Um, more consistent achievement of what is most important in life. And this will, of course, include our careers, but maybe it's not just a career. Hopefully for most of us, there are other things that capture our imagination, um, uh, including family and other things that we want to dedicate ourselves to. So that having the energy to be able to dedicate dedicate ourselves to whatever it is we want to and to do it really well and then ultimately to to have consistent fulfillment that this thing of real joy that comes from life work and relationships is not just kind of a random thing that happens around you know maybe a, a milestone achievement this is something that that we actually have as a default state as we go through life so it's a pretty compelling value proposition and I've put this one to the test myself so I'm a, a, a firm believer in walking the talk. The opposite, really, or the alternative to a high-performance mode um, is, is that we are experiencing some quite different things. So if in your energy you're feeling sluggish, tired, maybe on the emotional side more dismayed or cynical, then this is this is really great feedback that you are not in that state. And so to think about it as feedback is a much more high performance way to think about it. Um, these things tend to go from bad to worse if we really lean, lean into um, these things as the only way. They are not the only way. They just speak to that the habits or practices you have now are not at optimal. So work to be done and um, and 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 we can... Um, discover how you can do that in the kind of unique reality that is your world so productivity the the word busy stressed um are very frequent flyers um of folks that are not in this optimal mode regardless of what the economy is doing regardless of the argument you had maybe with your partner um or that the team is not where you want it to be and what we tend to do is in that busy stress mode we give more time because in that mode we're actually not able to perform at optimal so we just kind of eke out the day rob the rest of our lives and actually have this idea idea that um that we're still um working or performing when in fact we are not product high productivity is not a function of more time it's not possible in fact um it's worth mentioning that according to neuroscientists humans have up to two and a half optimal prefrontal cortex hours a day and that's that you know that part of the brain that we're using in our conscious uh activity, anything that we're applying our conscious energy to. So it's up to two and a half hours. And for the most of us, it is at the beginning of the day. So that idea that we can kind of drag or what I call bleed between work and and what should be our our, our time of rejuvenation is is just it's completely off. So achievement, work becomes almost the only thing. It is on our mind uh, when we're not there, we're working late, and the rewards are no longer as rewarding than the, that, that as that they used to be. Um, guilt, we feel guilt more often than not because working hard, stretching that business day, or, or whatever it is we're giving more time to and robbing the other parts of our lives, guilt will usually be a consequence. So... I'm underperforming for those I love. So this time that we're living in, particularly right now in, in, in the world, but in, in particular in Aotearoa NZ, where the recession is flogging us, is maybe for many uh, the justification for feeling some of the things that you're seeing here on the screen, and it absolutely should not be. With great practices comes the capacity to be buoyant, no matter what the external environment is doing. So 
we have this idea of soul force or life force. It's the heightened energy you feel when you're amped to get stuck into something you really want to do. You are awake, you are alert, you are focused. You can feel your body kind of fizzing. Um, and that is the default state, another way of talking about the default state. So here are the inputs to give you that powerful state as your default. Number one, it absolutely starts with energy. Who we are is carried inside of a human frame. And it is absolutely abundantly clear now how that human body and brain can function optimally. So it starts with energy from a strong physical core. We can then take to the others, which are not absolutely not in order of priority here. This is a circle, um, but it is about who I am, what is at my core, my true self, and how do I access my power? to do whatever I want to do and to shine and to excel. So that's kind of a resting state version of, of each of us. We're performing a lot during the day, uh, uh, bringing our skills, our talent, but actually at our core, there's a very still and powerful version of us that we can bring to the party anytime we need it. It's something we don't often get to consider, but it's absolutely something, again, that can be powered up for you. Our mindset. Um, how we think and take to the world um, kind of on an optimistic, pessimistic spectrum, we all sit somewhere. Um, I'm going to introduce you today, in addition to all of the energy fundamentals, because I really want to give you a, a bit of a leg up just based on the short time you'll be watching this. Um, I'm also going to touch on one really powerful thing um, called anti-fragile, and I'll share a little bit more about that in a moment because it is one of the mindsets that can really rocket fuel your daily experience. Emotion, uh, this is the data that our body is, is telling us something of importance needs our attention. So ignoring that, suppressing it, avoiding it, not talking about it, we're all socialized to some version of that, and it is really unhelpful because in the words of uh, the fabulous uh, uh, Susan David, who studies emotion, emotion is data. And we should never ignore data about ourselves. It's the lovely connection between our core, that identity piece I was talking about, and uh, what we need to pay attention to. So again, something that has been really hijacked in the time we live in this kind of cult of busy is our capacity for focus. In part, that is about technology. Um, and in part, is it about it's about the busy, work hard, do more syndrome. Um, but again, it is possible to learn how to curate your focus and to place your attention on what is most important whenever you want to. And then mission. This is the thing that um, you want to dedicate your time to. It might be the thing you call your job right now. It might be something that your job is on the pathway to doing at a different time. Um, it might be running the country <laughs> as one of the political leaders, maybe, Simon. Um, so whatever your mission is, it's the thing that you care most about that you can't stop thinking about. It may not be the thing you're doing now, but actually, if what it Whatever you are doing now, I can promise you, is part of your mission in any case. Because if you're not doing what you would think your mission to be now, this is part of the training ground. So understanding how to be um, on a mission that, for, for the most part, will be in service to something that is more than just ourselves. So how to do that part, which is, for most of us, the thing that gives us the greatest sense of fulfillment. So let's just look at this a little bit more in a slightly different way. So we're going to start with energy in just a moment because we want to be powered up for life. We want to actually, and we're not going to focus on most of these things today, but I just want to sort of set the um, the note for you that who you are at your core is something that is there, available to you always. I sometimes describe the core as um, the me, the you, the us, before anyone told us what we should do. Um, and it's from that place of certainty um, and confidence and calm that we are our most powerful. So understanding that then mindset, how do we create a mindset where we go through life not hoping things go my way? That is a deeply flawed strategy. And we are all participating in it. However, 
it is flawed. And so an alternative and a really great sort of frame up of this, thanks to the Stoics, is the obstacle is the way. So on your life slash business career or or a mission journey, whatever is in front of you, it's for you. How do I know this? It's your journey. It's in front of you. It's for you. And so getting curious about what that might be is a phenomenal way to go through life. So I'm going to come back to that in just a moment. Emotion, being connected to my core messenger. At my core, I am calm. I am clear. I am confident. And from that core, my body is going to give the me that's very busy in the world signals that I need to pay attention. And emotion is the language between core me and the me that I'm using most of the time, my conscious awareness. So that's a really great way to think about if I feel it, some kind of emotion, get curious because it is data and it's going to help me to do better um, at whatever it is that I'm doing. Focus, cur curating my attention on what's important now, doing that over and over again, curating my attention on what's important now and holding my attention. And yes, that will be without a device present. Um, so Last but not least, being in, so, in service to something that's greater than me. And if you are in that job that maybe isn't rocking your world right now, I do promise you that in time you can send me an email and say, you were right, Tara, this was part of the journey. I look back now and I can see how that fed to the next thing that fed to the next thing. But actually, you can still find in the role you're playing right now, there's something that is greater than you if you get curious and look. All right, let's focus on... Here's a great quote, actually. So we're gonna we're about to delve into energy, and and I came across this quote quote from Bill Bryson. If you are, it's a little I've I've uh, carved it just a little bit. He says, if you are an average sized adult, you will contain within your modest frame enough energy to explode with the force of thirty very large hydrogen bombs. Wow, assuming you know how to liberate it, mm -hmm. and that's what we're going to talk about now. Thanks, Bill. Love that. So when it comes to our life or a soul force activation, this is something we can intentionally do every day. Right now, we're going to focus on energy and we're going to talk about the five energy fundamentals. I have actually, without numbering them, put them in order of priority. There is no... Um, there's no kind of actual ranking of these from any of the scientists that are researching them. I have come as close to hearing Matthew Walker say that he would he would say that sleep is the number one. I've put this to the test um, for several years um, for myself, and I would have to agree with him. So again, I have put all of this to the test. This is something that is very much a daily practice for me. So this order is is pretty solid. So we're going to talk about sleep fundamentals, movement, deliberately not fitness, movement. I'll explain in a moment. Breathing, nourishing and hydrating. Um, it probably won't come as any surprise to you that um, these are fundamental to life. Without any one of these, you will die. But um, and actually, many of us are at expiration kind of levels of quality with most of these, unless we are intentionally curating the optimal. Again, imagine sort of expiration down one end and up the other end is flourishing. Um, when it comes to any of these, you can, you know, dial sleep up or down them um, and to flourish, you need to have each of these dialed in again within the sort of constraints of your lived experience and reality. So let's jump into some of the details here. And again, I'm being very brief to give you something to kind of grab onto that you can kind of get going with. So when it comes to sleep, it is clear we need a minimum of seven to nine hours, a minimum. So the question really is, what is your number? It's not possible to sleep too much. Um, you know, if you're sleeping 10 hours, that is, it's not a bad thing to do. Um, but on the regular, you want to be looking for somewhere between seven to nine. The actual measure, however, is how did you feel when you woke up? How did you feel? Did you feel energized? I woke up energized this morning, stoked. 
Why, why did that happen? Because of what I did before I went to bed, actually, that set me up for my body to go into a deep rest state, to do all of the other work that it needs to do. There's a ton of work that the brain and body are doing while we sleep, sleep and why we would die without doing it. So here are some of the things that, that we need to pay attention to. These are the habits that will give us a great night's sleep. Aim to consume your last meal. And if you do drink alcohol, that also for four hours or as close to four hours before you go to bed. So consume your last glass of whatever your bliss is and your last meal, ideally, or get as close to four hours as possible. The, the job of processing in our bodies is quite a labor intensive job. So going to bed soon after means it will be very hard to get deep, nourishing sleep. The next thing is have a digital sunset. This means going off your device and dimming the lights to what um, would be very low lamp light one hour before sleep. This is about two things. It is about what light does. It tricks the body, which has not evolved beyond the natural circadian rhythm of the rising of the, and the setting of the sun. So even though we might stay up longer and we can use lights, the body doesn't know that light from our electricity is not genuine light. So it's really messing with our circadian rhythm. So going to campfire light really because our bodies also have not evolved beyond our kind of recent uh, caveman, not caveman, hunter gatherer and um, forebears. So um, that's the first thing about a digital sunset and why it's important. The second thing is stimulation. Being on devices or watching your latest next Netflix um, uh, blitz, uh, which I also love to do, is 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 actually stimulation. Um, uh, gliding through your socials is actually stimulation. They're designed to do that for you. And so what we want to be doing is going into a lovely slow down into a, a relaxation mode before we go to bed. When I first came across this, in case you're one of those people going, what the heck, um, what would you do for an hour before bed? Um, well, I, I can guarantee that you're going to discover some great things, including maybe reading a book in a normal way, like an actual book. Uh, I don't know, spending time with you, your partner, uh, getting ready for the next day. There's, there's really, um, it, it's up to you my friend uh there are things to be done uh have a bath that's another really good thing so getting ready for bed then interestingly the thing of having a shower or bath it it the thing that's happening with heat is actually a very good thing because the next point is have a cooler room you will not sleep very well if you do not have a somewhat cool environment to sleep in. And so having a warm bath, so you're raising your body temperature, going into a cool environment um, without boring you with the details, the signs of that is pretty clear. Both of those things get you into sleep mode really quickly and the cool room will keep you there. Then have a room that is dark so that the outside light is not shining in again thinking about how the body is responding to any light stimulus and thinking that um, it's time to get up or some version of that so that is sleep movement this is a major for me i noticed the greatest uplift in my energy from this in particular so when it comes to movement i am not going to tell you to get fit the folks who study what the human body needs, again, thinking about our hunter-gatherer um, uh, forebears, um, the most modern, we're, we're looking at the Olympics right now in Aotearoa NZ uh, and the world, the most modern of those folks move at a roughly 10% of what our hunter-gatherer folks did. Not fitness level, right? Movement. So we are living in an age where we have become profoundly sedentary. And maybe you don't look like you have, you know, you're carrying a lot of weight. That is not a measure. Movement and how much we do it is what will also determine how well the body processes everything, how well blood moves around our system and pumps through the heart and then goes into our brain. So increasing our focus and our attention and our um, joie de vivre. So the more we move, 
the more energy we will have. So this idea of doing, you know, uh, at fitness in the morning and then sitting down all day, it is very, very bad for the human body. Um, the body needs to move and it needs to move consistently. In fact, um, at about the 15 minute mark, somewhere between the 15 and the 16 minute mark, your body needs to move. And it will let you know that because you'll naturally kind of do some sort of a, oh, you know, you'll, you'll do something yourself. But it is important to build a rhythm of roughly hourly movement. So moving consistently across the day and actually looking to build a diet of movement into your day. This whole body has muscles in lots of different places. So how is the strength in your arms and how can you ensure that as you age, your body doesn't atrophy so it can't serve you? It's possible if we pay attention to the things like I'm sharing today, that our modern selves can live to about 110. And living is not really the point because that's lifespan and, and people are probably thinking, ooh, you want to be a crusty old lady, not able to do anything. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about health span that you can live well into that age beyond our, you know, our parents and grandparents couldn't have imagined. And it is all starting here with this energy. Um, and so personally, I've done lots of different things in my life. I've run, um, I've done yoga, and those have been my two major kind of um, groupings of exercise slash fit fitness I don't do either of those at all but I do have a very uh interesting mix of movement and and a diet of movement so squats um abs arms and steps and moving and when it comes to steps the 10,000 number um, that we have heard, great number, by the way, great number. If you can get 10,000 steps in a day, it's going to be good, but you actually don't really need that. It is more about the diet that you're giving to your body that will really increase both heart rate and strength. So when it comes to heart rate, the best kind of walking is the one where you can just keep a conversation going, but you're conscious that you need to also focus on your breath. So that's what I do. Um, I have tested this out and found myself to be in the top percentile of my age group when I did a Spartan obstacle course. Um, uh, very interesting. I didn't. I wasn't interested in it, but I did it on a leadership program, and uh, yeah, I was stoked. So, more importantly, what we're talking about is energy to live the life that you want on your terms, right? So, breathing. This is the last one I'm going to go into in in some detail. We often have forgotten how to breathe because we breathe through our mouth. There are many reasons, depending on your life experience, as to why you're doing that. But actually, we need to breathe through our nose. It is has much inbuilt inbuilt technology to do the job of transferring the air that we breathe in into something productive and useful for the body. The the air that we breathe is essential to many, many things, and it needs to be processed through the nose, in through the nose, out through the nose. Ideally, when you're doing intentional breathing, which is a great thing to do, and I'll touch on in a moment, make the out breath longer. So in through the nose, out through the nose, out breath longer. And then as a practice, do breathing at the end and beginning of things as you go throughout the day. If you found yourself emotionally triggered for any reason, go into some really um, considered breathing where you just take a bit longer to take the in breath and then certainly still keep that out breath longer, but just do it really slowly. So go through the rhythm of maybe doing two. This is something that actually changes our brain chemistry and takes us out of some version of fight flight which is what we will be in if we've been triggered and into more importantly even if you're not triggered it will enhance your what's called the parasympathetic nervous system that cool calm energized focused version of you so that is literally a high performance tool using your breath intentionally but also using the nose so just a couple of things to, to touch on around nourishment um our understanding of nourishment has been um compared to where um uh surgery was in the middle ages 
we're in a huge ramp up of research and understanding this, but there are some real sort of bottom lines that they've come to and they are eat whole foods. Um, there's a great um, uh, phrase for, for about 95% of the food that we, we see in our um, uh, supermarkets and it's called food like substances. <laughs> it is, is highly processed and um, so thinking about eating more stuff that was grown is really important. Limiting processed food. There is a lot of stuff. Again, our bodies have not evolved to effectively process some of this really high processed um, food like substance. Um, I love some of them. I'm a huge pasta fan. <laughs> Um, uh, we live in an age where you, where you can have a food in a bowl. I know it's easy. I understand it. I get it. But actually, again, it, if that's what we're doing, then we are going to be at the effect of, of what those highly processed uh, chemicals do to our body, which is really to take it into that deeply sedentary and often quite ineffective and sick mode. The last thing, and this is a real hard liner, um, sugar, avoid it. It's, it's almost impossible to avoid it. It is in fruit, it is in vegetables, but particularly avoid processed sugar. Sugar is one of the most closely correlated substance with cancer. It is called cancer food. So avoid, if you can, any of the highly processed versions of it. Um, I've got my own Achilles heels in this area. Um, but again, Knowing these things, do your best, move from whatever you are now, one step closer to some form of optimal. Again, your body will tell you, um, like waking up in the morning energized will be the consequence of a well-planned and then well-executed sleep in an energized body is what you're going to have. And it's the kind of thing that you will say, you couldn't pay me to go back to the habits that I used to have. So lastly, hydrate. Um, and, and there we go with my error in the slides. So hydrate uh, should not say what it said above. Uh, so here's the deal. Um, paying attention to what our body is telling us. And I'm going to make a point now because I'm I'm actually feeling a bit parched. Well done. So our body tells us when we need more hydration, it is a great idea to get yourself one of these. I would forget to consume pretty much any water if I didn't have the habit of filling that up at the beginning of the day and then doing some other things so that I consume roughly um, two and a half liters of water. Um, we are consuming water through other things like fruit and um, and the beverages that we have. And some of those are counting, but water and un um, uh, chlorinated or pure water is definitely going to be best. So the, the highlight here is remembering that our bodies have not evolved. And so we need our habits to be in line with how our body operates. Flying through this, people, and, and coming to the pointy end. So again, we're going to focus on um, just one part of mindset today, because this is also something, this thinking, anti-fragile, um, is, is a phrase uh, by a gentleman called Nassim Taleb, a very intelligent gentleman who wrote, um, has written a number of books, actually. And this book is the third in what he calls the Concerto series. And he claims that what he discovered in the deep research he did for this makes this book the one to read if you had to choose the one. He considers this his best work, actually. So what are we talking about? Let's actually get him to tell us. So this is from the book. Some things benefit from shocks. They thrive and grow when exposed to volatility, randomness, disorder, and stressors and love, adventure, risk, and uncertainty. Yet despite the ubiquity of this phenomenon, there is no word for the exact opposite of robustness. So um, you're always a friend to me if you make up a word. So Nassim says, let's call it anti-fragile. Uh, we made it all up. Why not make up a word? It's a great word. This property, anti-fragile, is the property that is behind everything that has changed with time, evolution, culture, ideas, revolutions, political systems, technological innovation. So 
let's zoom out from that quote for just a moment to the world we live in, to the universe we live in, which is constantly expanding. So the world we are living is also in a universe that is expanding, so it is changing all the time. We are living in a particularly turbulent time as many factors come to bear on the disturbance on our culture, our civilization, the business world. Right now is a really important time when a lot of things have sped up and when how we are feeling hasn't actually kept pace. We are feeling, and you will know it hasn't kept pace, if we think for a moment about how we think about resilience. If we think about the resilience spectrum, we think down one end is low or lacking resilience, and we would talk about the other end as being robust. I get knocked down, but I can get up again. So that's really where the general conversation, and most people you will have heard say something like, uh, yeah, that was, yeah, that was, that was really tough. Oh, yeah, that, that, yeah, it sucked. But you know what? Yeah, I suppose I could learn something from it. And that's almost like the sainted version of resilience. And that suck really actually happens and that it shouldn't happen to me. And it shouldn't happen to you. And we go about life writing our plans and crossing our fingers that life is going to go my way. So if that's how you're living, this is how we are dismayed at the current um, disturbance to life that has been recent events and the recession is one thing. We're all waiting till some version of normal comes back. Um, but actually, it's not going to come back. The world is going to continue to change. So do you want to live vulnerably in it? And this is what Nassim is suggesting here. It is possible, given that change is a constant, it's just a matter of size and scale. Is it big change? Is it small change? Our, our bodies are changing moment to moment. Some of our cells are reforming over and over and over again, or rather we're producing new cells over and over again. So he goes on to say, anti-fragility is beyond resilience or robustness. So he said, it's like, I am changing the scale completely. The resilient resists shocks and stays the same. Can't wait to get back to normal. Resisting shocks, hoping you'll stay the same. Sorry, my friends. The anti-fragile gets better with shocks. This is why the anti-fragile loves randomness and uncertainty, uncertainty, which also means crucially a love of errors. So the idea that we can replace the current version of resilience with anti-fragile means we take to life looking for what's coming, expecting to be surprised and embracing it because on the other side of this event or series of events is the next level of me. So um, a high-performance mindset says I'm anti-fragile. I'm beyond res uh, a robust. Anti-fragile says bring it on. And to that earlier phrase, the obstacle is the way. Happening to you, my friend, it's all yours. That's what my coach used to tell me. Landed on your desk, Tara. It's yours, my friend. So we can complain. And put ourselves into a, a victim mode. Fine to do that for a minute. We're all human, right? Uh, I have my moments for sure. But if you want to live life on your terms and have everything that has, is happening make you better, then anti-fragile is your new best friend. So the unexpected, of course, we plan and things go differently. So we say, oh, that's interesting. I didn't know it was going to go that way. Huh, thought we did some pretty good thinking. So it's going to go differently. Fantastic. So we don't have plans in my business. We have uh, research experiments and we have this practice of as soon as that experiment goes into play, our job now becomes not what are the results, but what is the data telling us? Because we want to tweak and move and shift and reshape and pivot so that we get to whatever the outcome is that we committed to. So the unexpected 
is how we expand. This is how we excel. This is how we become people who get to live life on my terms. So every time the unexpected surprise happens, didn't get the deal, lost the job, the mortgage rates went up. Um, I just got sideswiped going into a car park. Um, you name it. That's interesting. I didn't expect that. Anti-fragile. I'm going to be better on the other side of this. So everything is working for me. So we've been talking a lot about us as individuals and it's essential. Actually, it all starts with us. So if we've got a team and you're thinking, how, how does this work in teams? I'm not going to go into this in detail today, but you can bet your bottom dollar that if you're feeling lagging and you're the leader, then this is not being modeled um, consistently. And this is why teams are also sluggish or rebellious um, in a not productive way. So it is absolutely possible. And we've got some wonderful tools to help teams and to build a culture where people come to work because they want to be there, because they're doing stuff that's meaningful. They're energized for it. And it absolutely starts with the individual. But if we are part of teams, we're parts of society. So it is a combination of me and how do I do this in a team? But speaking to the leader, it really is something that has to start with us. We have to be prepared to walk the talk. And I dare suggest, reap the rewards uh, associated with these practices. So um, that is me, Simon. Um, I am done. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Tara. There's so much in all of that. Um, I mean, one of the, you know, you haven't referred to a lot of it, but I but I know this to be true. So, but I'll ask you as the question. So much of what you're talking about, you're not just stating your reckons. It's science, knowledge based. Yeah, yeah. Look, I, I that, that's that would really be my deep passion. My mission is to understand how how it, how it all works. Um, I take uh, nobody's word for it. It has got to have research behind it. So everything that I've shared today is deeply researched, not by me. Some of it is actually, but a lot of it is put to the test in me. But absolutely everything I talked about, there is research projects galore and books, um, which I didn't share just to get bogged down. But there is a pretty much, you know, there is a highly recommend list of books in all of these areas, Simon. So, yeah. Fantastic. And, and, you know, you talked about the cult of busy, and I think we all would have a sense of what you mean, and we, many of us are living it or have lived it. Um, you really helped me with that. I mean, a couple of the things, I'm far from perfect still, but uh, and feeling a bit tired at the moment, cynical, no, uh, maybe. But, uh, you know, a couple of things is, one, at the start and the end of the day, that start day, just giving yourself, you know, that focus time, uh, without distractions, the, the phone, the social media, the um, 50 emails. And and then also, you know, at the end of it, you know, or at the start of it, deciding when you're going to end it, being clear, no, my day is going to finish at this time. And, uh, you know, last night, for example, which is, you know, would, would have been useless at a while ago, you know, a spa with the family, lots of good conversations and book reading with them and some of these things, which is fantastic. So, so that was really just to thank you, but actually talk to us about the two and a half or the two, two and a half hours. I think your thesis based on, again, the science and the knowledge is that, um, you know, we don't have 15 hours of good time when we can do lots of things. We've got these short windows. Yeah. Yeah. So th thanks for bringing it back to that actually, because it'd be good to flesh it out. So, um, for most of us, uh, there's a great book called Deep Work by a gentleman called Cal Newport. He's He is a, a researcher. And um, Cal talked about deep work being the most um, highly valued work that any of us will do. It's the work where we really need to apply our attention and our brain to. It's the planning work. It's the reflection work and trying to work out what, what's happening. What do we need to do? You know, maybe learning something new is an example of stuff that you can call deep work. So... What we want to do is build a practice where understanding that we have that two and a half hours and that not everything that we need to do in the workday requires our quality brain resources. There's stuff we can do in our sleep, right? Um, processes, meetings, unless it's a board meeting or a strategy meeting when, you know, you should have that as close to the beginning of the day. 
But um, what we want to be doing is really owning the beginning of the day for the most important stuff. So, you know, we have a formula we'll, um, that we offer up for leaders, which is we plan the day first. Then we decide what's our deep work and we do that first. Deep work might be the kind of thing you want to avoid. Um, I do a lot of writing. Um, I always want to avoid it. Um, and so I do it at that time. And I have a range of things that I do to keep myself motivated. So I do that and not the easy thing. It is also essential uh, that this two and a half hours is kind of kept as golden without things like email and our mobiles around. So if you're a leader, you want to be using that thinking time before and without your mobile phone and email. There's an interesting um, uh, stat about email, and that is that it it really runs through the key things that our prefrontal cortex uh, is is doing very rapidly. So our conscious thinking is doing five things, understanding, deciding, memorizing, inhibiting, and recalling. And email just sucks that really quickly. Um, and for most of us who ever thought, oh, I'll just get through a few emails before I get stuck into the real world work and then blinked and it was two hours later. And and what actually triggered it is a feeling of kind of like, oh, I just feel really sluggish. God, and you're blinking your eyes. So you want to, that's why avoiding technology before you use that two and a half hours is really essential. And then I guess as leaders, you know, we want to hold ourselves accountable to be doing the leader job, which is usually that more strategic role before we go into serving the team, serving the customers, the stakeholders, the investors, whoever it is, because you don't need your optimal resources for that. So the creator version of us is what we want to think about that sort of deep work component and that limited amount that it is. And, and you would say, you know, just to draw this out and make it explicit, you know, multitasking isn't a thing. That's, that's, yeah. that's, uh, you know, we, we people who say they can do seven things at once, that's not for no. real. No, and, and look, it, this is all often um, spoken about in, in regard to women. Aren't they brilliant? They can do everything. Well, actually, women are brilliant because they are dependent upon to do the primary family um, role as, as more than the men. Um, and in this modern era, um, they're doing that as well as their full time paid role most of the time. But science is pretty clear. Um, the brain is incapable of multitasking. What it can do is task switch. So what we're doing is we're moving from one thing to, the, to another. And as we do it, we are basically dwindling our capacity for really great thinking. Yes. It, the numbers are actually, it takes roughly 15 minutes once you leave an activity and give your attention away to get your attention back in full focused order, roughly 15 minutes when you do that. And this is, again, if you think about that, we're all doing that, Simon, we're all saying, oh, brilliant multitasker that I am. Yes, I'll do that. No, I'll, I, you know, I, I, I won't do this. I'll, I'll, I'll do that next. So the idea of, I, I sometimes talk about considered, deliberate and intentional is sort of a good threesome of words for replacing that sort of chaotic, random, um, reflex, uh, um, reactive mode that we are in a lot. Fantastic. Um, and look, there's so much we could talk about. I could talk more about focus. We could talk about um, sleep. And you put me on a great book. Um, I think it's that Matthew Walker, is it? Um, Why We Sleep and about that deep rest state that we need. Um, but let's, I suppose, we'd be, we better wrap this up and let me do it in this way. Ask you this, you know, what, what are the, you've said it in many different ways, but I suppose in summary, what is the benefits of this um, energized tranquility, anti-fragile um, positioning that you're seeking to have us and our teams in? Yeah, I think the bottom line is feeling in control of my life, uh, kicking butt with my role, um, confident and calm. So those are the kinds of um, consequences of having a really great 
systematic or habitual way of curating your energy and time and focus um, as you go throughout the day. Absolutely. Fantastic. Hey, thank you so much. So, so much there. And of course, people can get hold of you on LinkedIn and various other platforms um, should they want to. So we just really appreciate your time, Tara Lorica. Thank you, Simon. It's been awesome.